Right, welcome back to another episode of Sofa Photography. As you can see today, we are out and about in the bush. Uh, not too much uh, sitting at the computer today. More about these big things here. And uh, we were on the way now to go and have a look at some sleepy lions. And we still are going to go have a look there. Uh, it's about quarter past three in the afternoon at the moment, which means the light is still quite harsh. But uh, given that it's winter at the moment, or at least going into winter, um, the light actually starts to become very usable from about this time. So we thought we would jump the gun, get out there, play with the lions, mess around with a bit of light, move around to maybe a herd of buffalo in the east if we can find them a bit later with the sunset. And uh, yeah, see what we can do as far as light is concerned, because that is the most important thing uh, in the world of photography. But as we were driving in classic Brit style, I just get a, oh, there's an owl in the tree. Uh, so yeah, I mean time and time again, she's proving to me that uh, she's actually better at my job than I am But that's okay. Yeah, anyway, so we've got a pearl spotted owlet up here and uh, I've just been taking some photographs of them. They're a wonderful little bird to see and uh, We'll definitely pop some photographs up for you around about now, but um, yeah He's just got some beautiful yellow eyes those little pearl spots there on the chest very nice uh, small owl maybe about the size of my fist so very tiny little thing and very, you know, unassuming. Today we'll be covering things like RAW versus JPEG, the two different file types. Uh, I'm going to be going over a few things to do with each one of those uh, categories, those picture categories, and how I would set my camera up for each, and uh, just what the differences are between them, and, you know, what the pros and cons are between them. Uh, and then, as I say, we're going to go take some photographs of some lions. I've got some of the, the, the owl here. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the computer a bit later. Uh, to deal with, you know, once again, that, that Lightroom catalog, dealing with your storage, and then I'm going to get into some proper editing with you guys. Maybe we'll do an image or two today. So here they are, guys, the, um, the fat Nauru male just looking at us, and the uh, four fat River Pride females. I know that sounds a little bit insensitive right now, but um, they are fat. They've had a good feed. They're looking quite lazy, as lions generally do at this time of day. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky situation for the lighting at the moment. I mean, obviously you can see they're lying in some shade. The sun is just to my right hand side here, quite high still. Uh, but as I said a bit earlier, because we are going into winter, that sort of golden hour area is quite, quite a bit longer than the summertime. Um, so lighting at this point in time, uh, at this point in the day, is actually quite usable and it's quite good. Particularly if they're lying in a, in a shadow like this. Uh, it just avoids uh, blowing highlights out and you know, getting things that just look too bright. And uh, you've got to remember that when it comes to editing your photos a bit later, because if you blow the whites out too far, you can't actually bring that data back. You can't save or salvage that image to a certain point. Anyway, what I promised you guys, and I just want to keep an eye on these lines as we do this, because if a good photograph turns up, you know, that's, that's quite an important thing. We want to edit that later at the computer. But uh, what I promised you guys was just an introduction to the two various types of photographs you can take. And uh, it's one of the, uh, how do I put this, one of the most opinionated parts of photography. You get people that will photograph in either RAW or JPEG, and that's the two file types that your camera can produce. Um, so a RAW image would just imply that your camera is making use of its full data collecting uh, services. So its full sensor is active and it is absorbing so much information from that scene, from every time you click the, the, the shutter. Um, so what that allows you to do is when you get back to your computer, you end up with a, a tremendously larger file. You know, my camera, for instance, this D850, it's got a 46 megapixel sensor or somewhere there, uh, will produce almost 100 megabytes uh, files um, each. So that's quite a huge file if you're shooting in RAW and what that allows you to do is use that data to bring up your shadows, bring up your highlights, bring them down, overexpose, underexpose, change the saturation, the white balance, um, change it to monochrome if you want, change it to anything, you know, the sky's the limit. It's, it's a very, very powerful form uh, of photography file. So when you're dealing with a, a completely RAW, RAW image, uh, it'll be very drab, not really rich in color um, and sort of... Uh, uh, lacking in the vividness department whereas when you look at a jpeg that your camera's taken uh, it'll be very vivid it'll be colorful and uh, and essentially what's going on here is when you photograph in jpeg you're allowing the camera to do the editing for you all right so do not think for one second that just because you photograph in jpeg that you're shooting straight out of camera that's not true at all in fact if you're shooting in raw you're shooting straight out of camera and then you can edit from there um, but if you're shooting in jpeg your camera is 
you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got software inside it and it has been programmed to edit its photos in a particular way. And that's why J uh, um, Canon and Nikon photos look so different. Or that's why iPhone and Samsung photos look so different. It's because each company has their own way of implementing their own JPEG editing. So it's really up to you at the end of the day. If you would like to shoot in RAW and spend hours at the computer because you do, but it's fun for those people that do enjoy it. If you'd like to do it that way, please do shoot in RAW. You're going to get so much more benefit out of your photography. You're going to be able to manipulate and edit your photographs. Uh, and remember, I'm not a huge advocate for over-editing images, but at the end of the day, no one is allowed to tell you what you're allowed to do with your images. So if you want to over-edit, go for it. If you want to make a very artistic scene or a very artistic feel out of a photograph, it's really your prerogative. Um, Whereas if you would prefer just to take photographs, happy snappy, you know, get pleasing results, you know, 90%, 80%, 70% of the time, whatever sort of percentage you would like to apply, it's not that bad. Um, and, and just sort of click and know that you've got a photograph, not have to worry about Anyone, right? uh, at the computer later and spend hours there, then rather shoot in JPEG, guys. Just remember, JPEG files are very small. They've thrown away a lot of the data. Raw files are very big and you have a lot of that data to still manipulate. But we'll chat more about that at the computer a bit later. For now, let's watch these lines for a little bit. I might reposition the vehicle to get broadside with them. Uh, and when I do that, we'll definitely get the cameras rolling again. We've been uh, photographing these lines for a while now. They haven't really been doing too much. The heads have come up every once in a while. The eyeballs have opened. The, the rolling over has occurred. But while I was taking photographs, I just thought about the whole RAW versus JPEG thing again. And there's, if there's one bit of advice that I can give you as far as RAW and JPEG is concerned, um, always ensure that you're photographing in the greatest quality file that you can. So in RAW, make sure it's the largest RAW image you can take. In JPEG, make sure it's a JPEG fine image. If you go through your camera, and this is the same for Nikon, Canon, and uh, I'm pretty sure Sony. But as you go through those JPEG settings, you can actually see where it says um, sort of fine, uh, I guess medium, basic, all of those sort of things. And the file size just gets smaller and smaller. So do yourself a bit of a service. If you're going to photograph in JPEG, make sure you're photographing at the highest quality you possibly can. The same goes for RAW. You, you, there's no point in photographing in RAW if you're not going to photograph at the highest quality that your camera can take. Now, another thing that you have to remember with this whole RAW versus JPEG debate is if you are going to photograph in JPEG, you need to be more aware of how you set your camera up. I mean, it, it can be a much quicker way to, to get keeper photographs than RAW photographs. As I say, you don't have to spend too much time at the computer. But if you are going to shoot in JPEG, uh, in Africa in particular, now I'm not talking, I'm an African wildlife photographer. I'm not, uh, I've never photographed in Alaska. I've never photographed in the great north of Canada or the Amazon rainforest or anything like that. But for Africa, it's a warm place, you know, it's a, it's a vibrant place, it's warm, it's, it's, uh, it's rich in, in those sort of golden brown colors. And for that reason, if you're going to shoot in JPEG, I'd recommend that you set your, your white balance to one of two settings, either cloudy, which will give you a warmer image, uh, or you can set it to Kelvin. Now, for those of you that don't know, Kelvin is just a temperature, it's a way of measuring temperature. And if you are going to set it to Kelvin, set it to a Kelvin of 5700. I find that always to be very pleasing and to give a very nice warmth to your images. Um, on top of that, uh, for your picture control or your picture style, depending on whether you're using Nikon or Canon, um, shoot in either standard or shoot in vivid for Nikon or faithful for Canon. Now what this will do is, is shooting in vivid, obviously it makes the colors more vivid. And if you're going to shoot with Canon and you put it in faithful, which is just another way of saying vivid, it's going to make the colors more vivid. But just be careful, you know, take photographs, experiment with these things, because if you are uh, photographing in cloudy, as well as with vivid, and uh, you know, in, a, in, in, a, in many particular scenes, uh, you can end up with a photograph that looks too vivid. It's got too much contrast and it can come off looking a little bit cheesy in your JPEG photographs. And of course you can't edit that back back at the computer a bit later. Uh, so yeah, just bear those sort of things in mind. And if you're gonna photograph in RAW, uh, you can literally just leave you know, your, your picture control or uh, picture style on standard. You can leave your white balance on auto. Uh, although I do put it on Kelvin 5700 because I like to have a bit of warmth and, and I don't often deviate from that when I'm back at the computer, but we'll look at that on Lightroom a bit later. Uh, but with RAW, you don't really have to worry too much uh, in terms of those things because you are going to do the editing yourself, not your camera. So yeah, just bear that in mind. So the, the main reason why we were coming to this particular dam is because there's a dead tree behind me and I wanted to photograph that with the sun going down and just fiddle with the exposure there. But there's a beautiful grey heron um, just on the other side of the dam here at the moment. 
and uh, you know, I thought let's try and get some photographs of him. I see he has just turned, which means his face is no longer in the sunlight. And uh, if there's any bit of advice I can give you is don't take, if you're in a lighting situation like this, where it is golden hour and the lighting is generally very good, don't take a photograph. You're just wasting time when, and, and space in your memory card unless that animal's face or that bird's face is sort of facing the sun. So you just wait for that opportune moment where they just turn, look, get the glint in the eye, and that's where you take the photograph. Right, so we're on the other side of the dam. I parked the vehicle just back there, but it wasn't quite the right angle. And this is where your legs come in quite handy. Rather jump off, get the right angle. Always make sure you get the right angle, unless there's lions lying around, then don't jump off rather, it's that one. But uh, yeah, let's carry on moving around the back of the dam. Our heron is just flying onto the other side, quite fun to watch. But there's a dead tree here, and I want to photograph that with the sun going down behind it. So let's go. I think this will be a pretty good angle. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, obviously it's a very bright scene, and when you are photographing into the sun, you always want to underexpose, particularly when all you're trying to do is get a silhouette of the tree. So if you have a look at the tree over there, um, you'll see it's, it's a dead tree. It's been there for yonks now, years and years since I started here. It's kind of looked like that. It's just slowly rotting away. But it is quite a, you know, it's just a bit of a case study for us to do here. So you don't always, you know, when you're confronted with a scene like this, just depending on what lens you have, you don't always have to do the, the portrait style, you know. Uh, it's not always needed, but for this particular situation, I'll try to take photographs of each and then when we're at the computer We can discuss it and then you guys can let me know in the comments which one uh, Which uh, angle you think is best or which crop you think is best So what I'm going to try to do is just get this beautiful sun sunlight uh, reflecting off the water. I'm going to overexpose to the max and Another added benefit of photographing like this is you manage to get your ISO all the way down, which is a great thing remember ISO is amazing. It gives you a lot of light, but it also takes away a lot of color and a lot of uh, saturation and it can also make your photograph a little bit noisy. So in this situation, I'm going to go right down to ISO 64 because my camera can do that. But for most cameras, it only goes down to about ISO 100, which is amazing nonetheless. Um, so that then allows me to get great vivid color and I'm going to overexpose quite a bit. So I'm at an, a, a shutter speed of 8000. Quickly have a look. That is the result. Oh, there it goes, disappeared. But that is the result I'm getting over there. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to carry on working with this. Right, guys, welcome back to the computer. Um, it was a wonderful afternoon spent out there taking some photographs. And before we jump into editing those, I just wanted to quickly show you my hard drives once again because there has been a few questions asked about this. So I have three SSDs um, in my computer or solid state hard drives. One has my Windows, the other one I have all my installed programs on like Lightroom, Photoshop and whatever else. And then the third one I have all my working images on. So this is where my catalogs will be months, years and so on. As soon as I'm done with a year or a month or whenever I feel like it, I'll back the, that up onto backup one and backup two, both of them at the same time, uh, just so that I have a backup in various places. Um, you can see I am running out of space. So yeah. I need to order some more hard drives, guys, but that's the never-ending story when you become a photographer. Anyway, in the spirit of uh, saving a bit of time, because uh, time is, uh, with these videos, they can go a bit long. Uh, so what I have done already ha is um, import all the photographs that we took. So you can see here on the right-hand side, I have my working SSD. I then have my D810 folder, my D850 folder. You can see all the, the images that I've put in um, over the last few weeks uh, during May. Um, and today I put in the 17th of the 5th, the 17th of the 5th for the D850 as well. And I just imported those normally into the catalog. So what we're going to do is jump straight in. I'll show you quickly these photographs of the owl that we were um, uh, looking at a bit earlier. Um, just because, you know, he is quite a cutie there. So when I go through photographs, what I'll do is I will go through them. And if I like a photograph, I simply just give it a star rating. You can do this by pushing the numeral one on your keyboard or your numlock. And uh, that just lets me know, not that it's a, uh, an amazing photo, but just that it's a photo that I would like to keep and try and edit. So in other words, what I'll do is go through these photos quite quickly. And as I find one that I like, um, I will just quickly give it a star rating if I enjoy it. Let's quickly check that one out. Looks nice and sharp. Yeah, I'm going to give that a star rating just so I know um, that those are the ones that I want to keep. Anything that doesn't get a star rating, I'm going to delete. But anyway, so what I'm going to do is quickly push the letter G. And that brings me back into my full library where I can scroll through and have a look at all the photographs that we took this afternoon. So I thought, you know, we spent a lot of time with those lions. So I thought let's maybe do um, uh, an image of the lions and edit that together. We had that heron. Um, that was a beautiful 
situation you can look out for my instagram i might put a photograph of that up there uh, but for this afternoon what we're going to do is just focus on doing one of the line shots and maybe one of those beautiful sunset shots so this is the da10 um, i have gone through the photographs they all look pretty cool i mean there's this one or these ones here where this gentleman is just looking so beautiful and lazy and the way that i just expanded that i pushed g to go back to this the sort of uh, library and e to make that photograph big and ready for me to look at and then i can zoom in zoom out you know do those sort of things uh, and then you push d to go to the develop module but i'm not quite ready to develop yet so i want to go back to the library module push g and i'm actually going to go into the d850 um over here and have a look because i just i felt like i took better photos on this camera today uh than the d810 but you know that's not always the case anyway so i had these beautiful photographs of this male lion rolling about and i thought this would be a fun one for us to photograph or to to edit rather it was fun to photograph nonetheless so let's check them out uh let's start somewhere here what you always need to do or what i always do is just check the sharpness on the eye you know make sure that it nailed it you know somewhat at least so let's check the next photo uh yeah that's looking beautiful um his eye is beautiful and beautifully in focus there and he is just a cutie pie so i tell you what guys let's edit this photo um and then we will move across and edit uh, one of these sunset photos but for now what i'm going to do is just give this one a, a star rating and that just means that i'm ready to keep it i don't ever want to delete it uh regardless of whether i edit it or not um or use it or not i don't want to delete it. i want to keep it forever but as i say um to a few people in the comments uh, from last week's videos and the previous weeks, I do delete many, many photographs. I do not keep very many, just in the spirit of saving space. But anyway, let's jump straight in. So we've got them there. I'm going to now simply push the letter D, or I can go up here and click on develop, but I'm in the habit of pushing D. So there we go. We are now in the develop module. And this is what Lightroom is so famous for, all these beautiful sliders. They can get a little bit carried away. People see that. They're a little bit intimidated. There's a lot going on. Uh, you start off with your basic sliders here, you then move down, you've got color, you have uh, split toning there, uh, you have detail, lens corrections, there is a tone curve if you want to add that. I don't often play with this for wildlife, but uh, I know a lot of people that do. Um, and yeah, so what I usually do is I go all the way to the bottom. And just by the way, I usually have an import preset put on these photographs, but today, because we're editing together, um, I didn't put my preset on. I wanted to do those edits with you. And basically what a preset is, is when you import your photographs, you can uh, have your preset that you've set up um, apply to all your photographs. So it just gives it some minor edits in the style that you are already happy with and accustomed to. And that's kind of where your signature is born. But anyway, these this is where I'm going to start with the RGB calibr calibration. Um, and remember, this is a raw photograph. This is what it looks like coming straight out of camera. So let's give it a little bit of pizzazz. All right, so let's uh, quickly give these each. What I usually do is just go up by 10 on each of these. It gives it a nice bit of warmth and it just gives it a bit of depth. As you can see, it's not um, immediately apparent uh, what I'm doing there. But if I was to just pull the reds all the way up, you can then see what happens. So all you really want to do is just introduce color back into what is usually a very drab raw folder or raw file. Next up, we go up to effects, and this is where I like to put in a post-crop vignette, and this is one of my signature styles. I really enjoy putting a vignette in. Um, vignette in, um, you know, a lot of people don't, but some people really do, and what I find is it just draws attention to the center of the image. So what we do is just go one, two, three, four. That's how I usually do it, down to about 20. With a bright image like this, you can push it a bit more, and you see what that does, just kind of makes the line the centerpiece. So somewhere around there, 35, I'm pretty happy. And I mean, you can play with the roundness, the feather, all of those sort of things. It's, it's really up to you what you would like to do. Um, you know, tinker around with these things, guys. Don't just let me, um, don't just, you know, go on what I'm saying or, or telling you. But yeah, given it a post-crop vignette, let's now move up to lens correction. So remember with every lens and camera, but more importantly with the lens, there's a certain amount of chromatic aberration that comes in and there's also a certain amount of warping that comes through the lens. It's a square image going through a, a circular um, barrel as your lens. So it's obviously going to have some form of warping around the corners. And if I just click this enable profile corrections, you'll see it kind of straightens up. It also brightens up, which gets rid of your post-crop vignette to a certain degree. Um, so you just have to decide which one you prefer. Um, if you want to bring back that vignette, just add a little bit more, you know, just bring it in a bit more. Um, and I actually like that. Basically, you can see here, it's picked up that I shot this with a 70 to 200 mm Nikon lens, and it knows what to apply in order to correct um, the warping that that sort of lens gives you. So anyway, that's step number two or module two that I play with. 
We then move up to sharpening, which is quite important, particularly for wildlife, but for all forms of photography. You really want to give your photographs a little bit more sharpness. It's usually not too visible with the eye unless you're doing outrageous sharpening but what you just want to do is make it screen and photo ready for when you do print or you do share it so what you do is you click on masking push alt drag across until you are happy where where you see highlights there is where it is going to sharpen so i'm quite happy with that you don't want to go all the way here because that's going to introduce noise into all those backgrounds you see how hazy all those lines are on the background you want to find where the lines are very very fine and well sort of um, highlighted there that shows you that you've hit good uh, focus so yeah I'm happy with that there so that shows me that now I'm just going to be um, sharpening those particular white lines that you just saw I then put this up to about 60 never go well I never go over 60 really um, I just find that that's kind of the limits between looking good and, and looking over sharpened uh, and then the radius I once again I can hold alt and drag this all the way up and you can see just mildly there in the screen you can see that lion's face coming out if I drag it down so when you're sharpening essentially what you're doing is you're adding a white um, uh, highlight next to each line and uh, the radius is just dictating how thick that highlight is so if I go like that you can see the the white lines are very thick around all those spots uh, but I usually just go to 1.8 leave it there and I find that that gives me some beautiful sharpening without pushing the limits too much and making it look uh, actually a little bit blurry at the end it's a bit strange Anyway, I'm not going to add any noise reduction because I don't feel like this is a noisy photograph and I would prefer to try and keep as much detail as I possibly can. Uh, but this will just simply get rid of noise. If your ISO was a bit high or your shutter speed wasn't correct, those are two things that will create noise in your images. Not just ISO, guys. Remember that. But we'll get into those videos. Right, next up, what I often do is I play with the color. Given that this is a male lion, I would like his um, fur tone and his skin tone and whatever you want to call it to stand out a bit. So I'll give the warm colors a little bit more, that yellow in the main, orange in the main, and the red in the main. And we're just going to pump that up a tiny bit. There's also some green in the background, which really looks pretty vivid, but you can always give that a little bit more just to make it stand out a touch more. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way he's looking. And I hope you guys are too. Right, so let's carry on going. This is just where you can play with all the colors. It's it's pretty fun to play here. And I, I I encourage you to mess around here. And, you know, particularly to get the blues out in the skies or blues out in water. This is how you do it. Okay. Right, so let's go up. We then have the tone curve, which I say, as I say, I don't use very often. But a lot of people that do architectural photography or people photography, they like to use this. It just helps you bring out highlights, bring down shadows, all sorts. It just adds a bit of a mysterious touch but i prefer to try and get natural uh, as natural a lighting as possible right so now we're into the basic um sort of editing module over here this is the first thing that you are um that you will encounter when you start editing in lightroom and um, it is the most basic form of editing all right so we got your saturation vibrance you know shadows highlights exposure all of that and what i usually do is straight off the bat i give my images plus 10 point 10 on exposure I'll then come down to dehaze and give this 15 and straight away you're starting to see a little bit more depth coming through the image but because I'm giving it a bit of haze sometimes the red orange and yellow down here can start to look a little bit too goofy if you will right I then give it a bit of vibrance so let's see how this works once again we could be getting a bit of a ginger ninja line going on but uh, we'll fiddle with the colors now and then I give it a bit of contrast as well because contrast never it can hurt actually I'll take that back all right, so he is looking a little bit ginger. So let's maybe take this orange away completely. And I feel like that's done the trick straight away. So there we go. And then usually what I'll do is I'll play with highlights and shadows. Just because they're there doesn't mean you should play with them uh, or should change them. But I always go up, check how the highlights look all the way at the top and all the way down. All right, so usually the middle ground is, is going to be the most pleasing. But uh, if you want to bring out some shadows, you can do that. Uh, or you can bring the shadows, um, bring up the shadows or you can bring them down. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with where it is. I might actually give it a little bit more exposure. There we go. And um, right, then I can always experiment up here if we want to go color or black and white. Let's try black and white. You know, it's a pretty cool black and white image too. But I'm going to keep it color for the sake of our editing. But I always try black and white or color. Anyway, lastly, um, what we can do is we can apply a crop here. So obviously he's quite a cutie pie you want to make him the center of it you can and that that eye is very well in focus or very nicely in focus um so if we want to put it somewhere like that just zoom it in on him a bit always remember to keep one of these crosses over the uh center point of your image or the main point of your image which is obviously his face and uh, let's see i have cut off his tail there but you know i think that's fine because people will be drawn to the eye 
Speaking of which, let's get in on the eye now. Um, that crop's fine. I might go back a bit later. I'm just showing you guys for argument's sake. But uh, let's go in on the eye now. And what I'm going to do is use this adjustment brush tool over here. I'm going to click there. And I'm going to click this box as well. That box just allows me to actually see where I'm drawing. So now that I've ticked that, you'll see this will be red. All right, don't worry. That red's not going to stick around. It's going to disappear as soon as I untick that box. So let's color in his eye. Let's give it a little bit more oomph. There we go. That's quite fine. Let's tick that away now. And uh, it's already got a preset of plus 20 because I've set it up like that, but it doesn't have to. Uh, but let's give it a little bit more. Actually, let's give it a bit of contrast. Try to get the black there in the middle to come out. You know, those sort of spires or lines coming away from the pupil. And uh, yeah, something like that. A bit of vibrance, a bit of saturation. And I think that's cool. You don't want to overdo it on the eyes. It's very easy to do so. But um, yeah, there we go. I think he's looking quite cute and quite goofy. I could also do something like this, guys, as far as crop is concerned. And just make one of those cool landscape-y, uh, sorry, um, um, portrait-y Instagram photos. Let's try and get a pour in there in the background. Um, maybe that one there. And, you know, it could just be a little bit of fun to do something like that. So, yeah, pretty goofy, but he's there. Um, I'm actually going to go back to where we had him which is right over there so yeah guys that is our line photograph edited um, obviously I would do a little bit more and tinker a little bit more and you know fiddle around but uh, let's save some time and let's have a look at one of these sunset photographs all right so I have got a few of them um, that I have admittedly gone in and had a look at already um, just because I couldn't help myself and this was one of those photographs here so this is what my final edit looks like there and this is what the photograph looked like before i did that so that's the original there which is beautiful nonetheless beautiful beautiful image you could have just used this i could have just used that straight away but i really wanted to try get some of the blue in the sky that was coming out and there was a fair bit of blue um, and i wanted to try and get the blue as well into the water here and so what i did is i went in and, and did a few things um, so let's get that back to full screen um, if you have a look at my edits here on the side, I upped the exposure by 10, I left the temperature where it is, contrast up by 5, highlights, I just wanted to get that sun a little bit more bloomy. Alright, so if I go back, you see there, kind of, we just wanted that to look a little bit more epic, if you will. Um, then the way that I got the blue up here is just by using this graduated filter. Um, they are over there, so if I hold my mouse over it, you can see where I'm filtering. And if you want to see what this filter looks like, it's basically just a drop down that you use. You pull it down and that's where I would have stopped earlier on that sort of center mark there. And that whole bottom line there is where your edit will take place inside this block over here. And then it will feather coming back down there. So I've done that already. And what I did when I was uh, playing with this one is I lowered the temperature to get the blue out of the sky and I upped the saturation just a small bit there to just get a little bit of a blue hue coming into that orange. It's a very pleasing color palette. Um, so yeah, very chuffed with that. I then added another one here at the bottom um, just to get a bit more blue. So you see if I hover over that, it'll show you where it is doing and where it's feathering off to. Once again, I dropped the temperature, dropped the exposure. I want it to be dark and mysterious towards the bottom and bright and happy towards the top. So yeah, there we go. Um, right, then moving on with the basic edits of the photographs. Once again, dehaze plus 15. I love it. Dehaze is amazing. It's really cool. I find it to be more effective than contrast. And it really does help to dehaze things like uh, mistiness or smokiness in your image. It does a great job. You can see here for the colors, I left it. The colors are really beautiful. Didn't have to do too much. I sharpened just the tree. So if I click here and push Alt, you see just that tree sharpened. 1.8 once again and 60 just once again. I did correct the uh, lens here. Let's see if I take it off. You see it just gets a bit darker around the edges. Bends out a small bit. But I'm actually happy with it on to be fair. It just makes it a little bit brighter in places where it needs to be. Uh, then here I took the crop away. Because it just looks a little bit cheesy. Or, or too overdone when you start putting a crop on. I mean it's cool. It's nice. If you like that go for it. Uh, but I did want just it to be you know the edges to be nice and bright as well. Uh, and then, as usual, my calibration, there we go, plus 5, plus 5, plus 5. Um, I found that to calibrate the in-camera colors quite nicely and give me a pleasing result. So, yeah, guys, that's a little bit of editing done for the week. And I think what we'll be doing for the rest of this sort of series is we will be heading out into the bush. We'll be looking for sightings, looking for unique lighting. Um, I'll be holding my camera, talking you through things. Uh, and then we'll come back to the computer. We'll edit uh, and, and so on. So, please keep your questions coming. And, um, you know, I'm always happy to 
uh, chat with you through the comments and also answer your questions in the videos so yeah it's an absolute pleasure for me to do something like that so the more you ask the better it is and as i say guys if you know a little thing about photography please feel free to discuss it in the comments below either on facebook or youtube and um, we can definitely get into a discussion on what the best way forward is uh, so yeah thanks very much guys wherever you are have a wonderful wonderful day or evening and enjoy your gin and tonic or your coffee or you know whatever it is that you have in front of you right now see you out in the bush next time cheers